All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the road of Tech Mixer 9. What a uh, crazy journey this has been. I hope that everybody enjoyed their time. Obviously, we came together as a team and thought, how can we do online experiences differently? How can we switch up the monotony of digital booths and chats that go nowhere? And how can we create what we've missed over these last 20 months, which was real conversations, right? Real opportunities to discuss uh, initiatives and geez, how about the weather, <laughs> right? I mean, just having fun with one another and, and understanding unique perspectives on the way to incorporate innovative technology into our workspaces, make our lives easier, our jobs better, um, and overall more proficient as IT professionals. So over the course of these two days, we have had over 100 attendees, almost 100 individual meetings, Ten, tens of thousands of megabytes of uploaded content. Um, but most of all, we achieved the biggest success, which was bridging that digital gap and having true conversations. Today's keynote speaker, Bill Stanton, is joining us to actually talk about connecting those dots and how important it is to have those random interactions that lead to a new way of thinking. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this off to Bill. Bill, the floor is yours, my friend. Oh, that's a big mistake, Ryan, but I appreciate your confidence. Totally undeserved as it is. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, how are you all doing? Welcome to TM9. Thanks again, Ryan, for that introduction. So I want to start off with a very, very important question for all of you. Do you like sitting next to weird people? I don't like sitting next to weird people. I think that's probably true for most of us. I mean, I mean, come on, have you actually ridden on a city bus? I don't like sitting next to weird people. Here's the problem with that though. It turns out that the, the weird people, they're almost never really weird, right? I mean, they're just, they're just different. And when we avoid people who are different, experiences that are different, ideas that are different, we're missing out on the connections that are the building blocks of innovation. Your next breakthrough could be one connection away. And if you miss it, it's gone. A few years ago, I was flying home to Seattle from New York. I had, a, I had an aisle seat. And sitting next to me in the middle seat was nobody. <laughs> I know, that's, that's, that's like the poor man's upgrade, right? So I'm doing my little internal happy dance when just before the doors close, one last passenger gets on the plane and she was weak. She was different. Uh, I didn't take a picture. That would have been rude, but this will give you some idea. So as she's, as she's shuffling and wheezing down the aisle, I'm looking around. I'm thinking, wait, Bill, don't, don't panic. Come on. It's a, it's a big plane. It's a big plane. Hey, come on. What are the odds? I'll tell you what the odds were, 100%. Yep. She stops right beside me, pokes me with her bony finger, points to my empty middle seat and says, please, <laughs> I am there. No more sad dance. So I did what you might've done. I put on my headphones. I put on my headphones and I escaped into my music. Music, music has always been my escape. Anybody else here? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So for the next five hours, I escape. Beatles, Beethoven, a little bit of Tom Petty, Miles Davis. And, and then, because I had just, just finished reading a biography of one of my musical heroes, Stravinsky, I cap it off by listening to his just magnificent Firebird Suite. As we approach Seattle, middle seat pokes me again. Apparently it's time for the obligatory final descent conversation. Do you remember this one? Is, is home for you? 
I'm, so, I'm sorry, what? He's, he's home for you. What? Oh, you mean Seattle? Yeah, yeah, Seattle's home for me. How about you? No, I have a long way to go. I go to Russia. Yeah, that's, that's a long way. Da, I have not been there since I was a young woman. I was teacher. And here we go. Teacher. Hmm. So what did you teach? Music. Did, did you teach Russian music? Of course. Okay, now that's, that's, that's actually kind of amazing because I was just listening. I mean, like literally just now listening to Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. Oh, Stravinsky, the Firebird. I was with him when he wrote it. <laughs> and then the plane pulled up to the gate. And I never saw her again. Think about this. I had just flown across the continent, separated by only five inches and a pair of headphones from possibly the most fascinating person I would ever meet. And I didn't know it until the last five minutes. I had completely written her off for five hours because she was different from me. How often do we do this? Miss out on an amazing connection because it involves someone or something different from us. And when we miss those connections, we also miss the opportunities. Opportunities to, to grow, to create, to innovate. And right now, as, as, right now as, as we emerge from a changed world into a changing world, we need innovation more than ever. I mean, you need innovation. You, you live and work at the intersection of communications infrastructure, connectivity, each of which needs a constant stream of innovation and innovative ideas in order to remain relevant, profitable, in order to thrive. So how do you, how do you become the source of that stream? How do you become that person who comes up with the breakthrough ideas? Well, that's what we're going to talk about for the next 40 minutes or so. We want to talk about that. We want to talk about how to connect the dots because it's all about connection which makes sense because Matrix is all about perfecting connections. So it's all about connecting. So we're gonna talk about breakthrough thinking for technology decision makers and how that can happen. But first, let's, let's, just, let's deal with the elephant in the room. Ryan talked about it early, or earlier when he talked about how virtual events like this, as good as they might be, <clears throat> and TM9 is one of the good ones, they're not quite the same as in-person events. So I wanna do a little survey here for you um, and, and with you, frankly. Um, if you have your cell phone, uh, here's, a, here's a QR code. I want you to go ahead and, and go to this QR code. I'll leave it up here, here for a little while. Go to that QR code. It'll give you a link to a survey. And the question you're gonna see on that survey is this. At an in-person event, you remember in-person events. Some of you may have been to some in-person events recently because they're starting to come back. But at an in-person event, where does your most valuable learning tend to occur? Is it the keynote or general session? Is it the hallway or bar conversation? Is it, is it the breakout sessions? Where does it tend to take place? We're seeing some results coming in now. Let's take a look at that. We're seeing, okay. Oh, wow, look at that. Yep, okay. Breakout sessions, break tied with hallway bar conversation. Okay, mm-hmm. Very, very good. Wow, look at that. That's interesting. I wasn't expecting that. Um, I wasn't expecting breakout sessions to be that, that high up, but that's pretty cool. But you see keynote, which of course makes me feel great because I'm the keynoter here. Not really up there. Okay, there we go. All right. So, but do you see where, where it says there? 45%. 45% hallway and bar conversation. Why is that? Because it's about the connections. Because that's where the connections happen. That's how important connections are. You know, there's all the other programming, all the other things, but when it ultimately, when it comes down to, and again, Ryan talked about this, it's just those hallway conversations. It's the, it's the how's the weather. It's, hey, how are you dealing with this? I know you had that challenge. I'm facing that challenge now. How are you dealing with it? That's where the real gold is. It's in those connections. And if we miss those connections, they're gone forever. So that's what I want to talk with you about over the next 
40 minutes or so that we have together about how, how we get to those connections and how we really make them, make them work for us. So to start with that, I wanna take a, a historical perspective. And I mean like ancient history. I wanna I want go way, way back in time. See if you, do you remember this 2019? Yeah, way back in, remember that? When the world looked like this, oh, so beautiful, right? I mean, everything, everything was peaceful and tranquil and we knew how everything worked and everything was just the way we wanted it to be. We'd finally figured it all out. And then what happened? 2020 happened and all of a sudden the world ended up like this, right? You remember, you were there. So what happened? I mean, obviously there was a pandemic, but I, th I, think, it's, I think it's more than that. I think it's more than that. You wanna know what my theory is? My theory is that 2020, the entire year was actually engineered by cats. Don't you think? Because they would do this, wouldn't they? They would do this. That's what, and by the way, that would also explain all those weird toilet paper shortages we were going through. So I'm, you know, just type an exclamation mark into the chat if you agree with me that 2020 had to have been engineered by cats. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's, it's the only thing that really makes sense. But nonetheless, this is, this is where we are now. This is where we were in 2020. And to some extent, this is still, still where we are. And as I look at businesses and organizations through the, through the eyes of the marketplace during this time, in times of uncertainty, in times of, uh, you know, we don't really know what's gonna happen next because we don't know what's gonna happen next. We try and predict, but we don't really know. I find, I find organizations landing in one of four places. The first place is a place that I call hibernation. Now, maybe some of you were here earlier in the pandemic. Hibernation, hibernation is when you're just kind of waiting for things to return to normal. You know, you just think, maybe I'll just wait it out. And you're just hoping that you don't have enough acorns to last until then. And a lot of us went into this in March, April, May of last year, 2020, just like, oh, this can't last much longer. And all of a sudden we realized that that's not going to work, that we are going to run out of acorns. So we have to do something. So another place I see, or, see organizations going in times of uncertainty is a place I call animation. Now, animation is when you're, you're basically, you're doing, you're doing stuff. What's the stuff you're doing? Well, it's basically everything you've always done, only you're doing more of it and you're doing it faster, right? It's like, oh, the, you know, this isn't working. Hibernation isn't going to work. We got to get moving. We got to do something. Basically, you're running in circles, but really, really quickly. Some of you might recognize yourself or others that you know in that place, place of animation. Then there's a place I call exploration. Well, exploration, you know you're in exploration when you're, you're actually trying new things. You're actually trying new things, but, but without a strategy, without a blueprint, without a game plan. You know, you're thinking, you're, you're feeling good because you're thinking, well, at least I'm trying something. You know, I know that we, the same old, same old isn't going to work. So we have to try new things. So at least, at least I'm trying something. I'm in, I'm in the game. Not sure if I'm going in the right direction, but I'm on my way. And then the fourth place, and this is kind of rarefied air. I don't see a lot of organizations here, but you see some people, teams, businesses, industries, organizations. You see some. It's a place that I call game changer. Game changer. Game changers is when, is when you're looking, you're actively looking for the connections that no one else is seeing. You know, you're asking the questions that no one else is asking. And because of that, everyone is looking at you as the leader. You know, they're looking at you either as an individual, a team, an industry, and going like, wow, there's someone who's figured it out, right? You've literally changed the game and everybody's going, oh, so that's how it is now. Okay, they figured it out. And now they're just following. They're trying to play catch up. So who are these game changers? Well, I think Matrix is one of them, which probably is no surprise. Matrix, you look at their website, what do they say about themselves? They say, we embrace a network first strategy. We collaborate with clients across the globe. There's that connection part right there to provide redundant, optimized networks backed by proprietary connectivity services that separate matrix networks from the rest. That's game changer. So how do you get there? How do you and I get to be that, that rarefied air, that game changer status that everybody's looking at going like, whoa, I wanna be like that. 
that's where the cool kids live, right? How do we get there? Well, let's talk about that. Do you know who I envied the most when I was in high school? Of course you don't. We've never met before. But I'll tell you who I envied the most. It wasn't, it wasn't the high school quarterback. I didn't envy him. I, I did envy him. But he's not the one I envied the most. You know who I envied the most? The school custodian. Okay. Now, some of you are thinking, Bill, you know, maybe raise the bar a little bit, aim a little higher. No, I'll tell you why I envied the school custodian. And may, maybe some of, some of you can, can relate uh, to this. Because the school custodian, do you remember? The school custodian was the one who had the master key. Oh, the master key that could unlock every door in the school. And by the way, yes, when I was in high school, that's what master keys looked like. I'm very old. But they had that master key that could unlock any door in the school. And so now I'm thinking, okay, is there a master key that can work in life? Is there a master key that can help us with uncertainty, no matter what comes at us next? Because again, we don't know what's going to come at us next. We don't know what next year is going to look like. We don't know what five years from now is going to look like. We barely know what next month is going to look like, right? But is there a master key of some sort that can help us navigate that? and work through whatever challenges life may throw at us. And yeah, there is a master key and it's called innovation. Innovation. And this should not be a surprise because we hear it all the time that we need to innovate. But what I wanna find out what innovation means to you. So I wanna, I wanna take another survey now. So let's, let's go to this link again. Again, there's the, uh, there's the link if you need it again. Uh, again, you know how to do this because you did it right the first time, so you can do it right the second time. If you go there, you'll see the new question is, what's one word you think of when you hear innovation? What's one word you think of when you hear innovation? I'll give you a little while to start thinking of some, some, some of these things. I know there's also a delay because of the live stream and everything, uh, but just enter a word once they start popping up, once the words start popping up. Uh, I'll start showing you the results. So hopefully that's going to be happening. So, oh, there's, oh, interesting. Oh, look at this. The first one that came out was money, innovation, money, technology, listen. New, oh, that's, that's fascinating. Invention, change, absolutely. Uh, change re requires innovation. Newton, very good. Uh-huh. Some science people here, of course. Buzzword, Apple. Absolutely. I'm working with an Apple computer right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at that. These are all aspects of innovation, solutions. Oh, that's great. Solutions. We're going to talk more about that a little bit because that is a huge part of it. Yes, exactly. Learn, method, buzzword. Look at those. That's fan. Man, you guys are good. Wheel. You guys are really good at this stuff. So yeah, that's all that. All that is involved in innovation. And again, look, this should not be anything new to you. Hearing me say, well, you know, we need to be innovative because again, you hear it all the time, right? Haven't you heard this over and over and over again? You know, we, we need to be innovative. We need to be creative. We need to think outside the box is what you need to do. You need to innovate, 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 innovate. And we hear that. And the problem is that those things aren't incorrect. We do need to innovate, but nobody's answering the fundamental question. How do you do it? Okay, how do you innovate? We're just being told, innovate, go out there and innovate, but nobody's saying, here's how you innovate, right? It's like, imagine this scenario. Imagine you're flying in a, in a small single engine airplane and it's you and you know a few of your friends and all of a sudden the pilot has, has a heart attack, right? And you're up, and all of a sudden everybody for some reason is looking at you and they're saying, well, just, you know, just land the plane, just land the plane. Well, that might be the right thing to do, but if you've never taken a flight lesson, it's not really the best advice, is it? Land the plane. I don't know how. So all of a sudden you're like, excuse me? Excuse me? What? Hello? That's not me. So, so how does it really work? Well, here's the problem. A lot of people think they can't land the plane, think they can't be innovative because people have the wrong idea about innovation. You know, because we don't know how to do it, we think we're not innovative, not creative. And people have this wrong idea about innovation. I find that so many people think that innovation is all about the, the lightning bolt. 
the lightning bolt that comes down from above and it only strikes the gifted few, right? Right, the Steve Jobs, the, the, the Elon Musk, the people like that, it only strikes the gifted few. Here's, here's the secret. We are all the gifted few. We can all learn this. I'm going to prove it to you a little later on. But still, there are a lot of people out there who feel, who feel like this woman. You know, I'm just not creative. I'm just not one of those innovative types. You know, do you know people like this? It's like creative. No, that's, that's not. No, I'm an engineer. I'm an accountant. I'm a, no, no, no. We have a creative services department for all that stuff. They have offices with beanbag chairs. We don't have that. We have, you know, Herman Miller Aeron chairs because we're, we're, we're not, we're not the creators. We're not, we're not the innovative people. You know, people like this, right? Just like, oh, I don't have a creative bone in my body. Well, you know, it's interesting. Years ago, they did a study on this. Um, by the way, I don't know who they are, but they are very busy. They do a lot of studies. So they did a study about this, and the goal of this study was to figure out, is there anything that separates the innovative people, the creators, creative types, from the non-innovators, the non-creative type, types? So here's what they did. They surveyed a whole bunch of creative types. So who do you think these would be? Like musicians, writers, poets, dancers, actors, uh, yeah, you know, you know the creative types. And they asked them all kinds of questions. They asked them things like, um, did you have a pet growing up? Do, do, do you play a musical instrument? Did your parents listen to music in the house? Uh, did they read to you? Did you play outdoors as a child? Did you have a lot of friends or do you have a few friends? You know, they just asked all kinds of questions of these people. And then they surveyed a bunch of the non-innovative types, the non-creative types, you know? Usually when I ask in a live audience, what types are these? I always get, you know, accountants, bankers, librarians, whatever your definition of the non-innovators are. They interviewed all those people, surveyed those people, and they asked them the exact same questions. And remember that the, uh, the goal here was to determine, is there anything that separates the innovators, the creative types, from the non-innovators, the non-creative people? Is there anything that sets the creative people, the innovators, apart? And it turns out there was, but there was only one thing, one thing, and it was this, the creative people, the innovators, believed that they were creative, believed that they could innovate. That's it. That's the only difference. But can you see how that difference makes all the difference? Can you see how if you go through life believing that you're creative, believing that you're an innovator, you'll, you'll, you'll have an entirely different existence. You'll, you'll literally invent a whole different universe for yourself. Just like if you go through life believing that you're smart or good looking or confident or popular, you create your own existence. You really create your own universe. So if you go through life believing that you're innovative, believing that you're creative, you'll see innovation and creativity opportunities everywhere because they're all around there. So that's the only difference. So don't say that you're not one of the creative types. You are. It just comes down to a matter of belief. And here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like in the real world. See, in the real world, we, you know, we, we kind of go through our day. All of us, you know, we wake up, we brush our teeth, we get dressed, have breakfast, go to work, or for some of us, that might be going into an office and just sitting down nowadays. But still, you know, we go through our day and every now and then we hit a brick wall. We run up against this brick wall and the brick wall is just an obstacle. It can be anything. It could be a flat tire on the way to that important meeting. It could be you stub your toe on a piece of furniture that's out of place. It could be, oh, I don't know, a global pandemic that shuts down the entire world. But we hit this brick wall and then, and then we have what I call a Homer Simpson moment. No! Right? We have this Homer Simpson moment. It's like, ooh, I don't like this. And that's where most of us stop. That's where most of us stop. But I'm over here now on this side. At the Homer Simpson moment, you know, we, we run into the brick wall, something that we don't like, an obstacle, a challenge, something. We have the Homer Simpson moment, and that's where most of us stop. I mean, we might, 
complain and whine about it to our friends and colleagues, but still, that's about as far as it gets with us. Now, let's take a look at the innovative person. For them, life looks pretty much exactly the same. They wake up, they brush their teeth, they get dressed, they have breakfast, they go about their day, they hit a brick wall occasionally, they have their Homer Simpson moment. No! But then, where most of us stop, they do one more thing. One more thing. They ask a question. And the question is simply this. How can this be better? How can this be better? That's really all innovation is at its core. Uh, one of you said that, solutions during, during the word cloud on what do you think of when you hear innovation? Solutions, that's what it is. How can this be better? And that should tell you something. That should tell you something about the nature of innovation, that innovations do not have to be huge in order to count. I think that's why a lot of us don't feel like we're innovators, because we think like, well, if I'm, if I'm not inventing the iPhone, then it doesn't count. You know, if I didn't invent the, you know, the internet or the Tesla, then it's not really an innovation. And that's just, that's completely wrong. Here's why. Because brick walls come in all sizes and shapes, right? Problems, challenges come in all sizes and shapes, which means that solutions, which are by their nature innovative, come in all sizes and shapes. And they count, they all count. I'll give you an example, I'll give you an example. Um, I think you're all too young to, 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 to be able to relate to this, but prior to 2002, none of us had ever tasted ketchup. It's true. None of us had ever tasted ketchup. Why? Because prior to 2002, ketchup grew in bottles like this. And it was impossible to get the ketchup out of the bottle. You know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, we tried. We tried everything. We tried pounding it on the bottom. We tried pounding it like this. We tried, like, look, if you hit it this way at an exactly 130.7 degree angle, it comes. We tried putting knives in there. None of it worked. None of it worked. So we never tasted ketchup. We all had ketchup, but mostly just as a color accent in the pantry next to the rice, right? We never tasted ketchup. And this had gone on for 170 years because for 170 years, ketchup grew in bottles like this until finally in 2002. So what was happening? For 170 years, anytime anybody wanted to have ketchup on their hamburger or heaven forbid their hot dog, because what are you, like seven? But anytime anybody wanted to have ketchup on their, on their hamburger, they had a Homer Simpson moment, you know? do oh, right? That went on for 170 some years until finally in 2002, some smarty pants person at the Heinz Corporation went to a meeting and said, uh, hey, you know them, uh, you know them ketchup bottles we have that everybody hates? What if we turned them upside down, right? Now you go to a store, you can't even get these anymore. Now you go to a store to buy ketchup and it comes like this, right? What's happened here? It's been pre-upside down did, right? That's an innovation. Now, could you come up with that? Look, hey, let's turn a bottle upside down. Could you come up with that? Of course you could. It doesn't have to be world changing to be an innovation. By the way, um, you can't even find these in the store anymore. I had to get this from Amazon. And when I did, it said, hurry, only two left. This, this is an endangered species. This is like the white rhino of condiments. I'm, I'm never selling this. But they come, but the, these, these innovations, they come in all different sizes and shapes. It all comes down to asking, coming up against a brick wall, having a Homer Simpson moment like the ketchup, and then asking yourself, how can this be better? That's all it is. And yet some people are still stuck in this idea of, of the lightning bolt. It's the lightning bolt. Well, earlier, Ryan told me that I'd won 29 Emmy Awards. It's true. My goal was 30, came that close. But I won them because for 15 years, for 15 years, I produced the longest running, highest rated, most award-winning regional comedy TV show in the United States. It was called Almost Live. Uh, 
there we go. There's a picture of me outside our studio door, Studio B of King TV here in Seattle. And now at Almost Live, our job, our job was to be innovative. I'm going to go over here now just to keep you guys guessing. Our job was to be innovative every single week. We had to invent a new show every single week. Our job was to be in inventive week after week after week for 15 years, whether we felt like it or not. And let me tell you something. When your job, when your paycheck depends on you being innovative, you can't afford to wait for, for a lightning bolt. Fortunately, what I learned over those 15 years is that innovation is not about some magic lightning bolt from above. Instead, innovation is all about connecting dots. Connecting dots. Now, what are these dots? Well, they can be anything. Ideas, experiences. An elderly woman in the middle seat. The meetings you had yesterday here at TM9, the conversations you'll have moving forward with your new friends and new, and new connections, those are all, all dots. And, you know, every, every idea you encounter is a dot, every experience you have. So the more, the more ideas you encounter, the more experiences you have, the more people you interact with, the more dots you'll have, which means the more connections you can make, right? Makes sense, right? Here's what it actually looks like. Here's a sheet of Avery dots. There's a lot of dots here, which means a lot of connections. That's good. That's good. This is what it looks like inside the brain of a breakthrough thinker, inside the brain of an innovator. Some people's brains, though, look more like this. Very sad. Not a lot of connections going on here. Some, some of you know someone like this, don't you? Some of you are related to people like this, aren't you? Yeah, it just, it just makes sense, doesn't it? That the more, the more connections you have, the more dots you have, the more connections you can make, which means the odds of one of those connections being that, that breakthrough idea increase dramatically. But what do you notice about these dots? Hmm? What do you notice about them? They're, they're all the same, aren't they? They're all three quarter inch navy blue. Now, if all of your dots are three quarter inch navy blue. If, if you only ever read the same kinds of articles, if you only listen to the same kinds of podcasts, if you only hang out with the same kinds of people and you only ever talk about the same kinds of things, if all of your dots are three quarter inch navy blue, then most of your, most of your connections, most of your creative ideas are gonna be three quarter inch navy blue, right? Okay, that's better than nothing but it's not exactly breakthrough, right? And it's not gonna get you into game changer because here's the problem. The odds are that your, your competitors are also collecting those exact same navy blue, three quarter inch navy blue dots. So they're probably gonna be making the same connections, but, but what if your dot collection looked more like this? Oh, now we're talking, now we're talking. You start connecting these dots, and there's no telling what color your, your breakthrough ideas, your connections are going to be a blue dot and a yellow dot. Make a green idea, right? And what if, what if these dots were also different sizes and different shapes? What if your dots, the ideas, the experiences, the people in your life were different colors, different sizes, different shapes? different beliefs. Can you see the difference that would make in both the quantity and the quality of your breakthrough ideas? Because the truth is, you never know. You never know which dot is going to be the one that makes the difference. You never know which dot is going to be the one that leads to the breakthrough. So you have to be open to those yellow dots. And we're not always. I come from a place called Lancaster, Pennsylvania home of the Amish. You can see there an Amish buggy, right? It's beautiful, isn't it? Peaceful, tranquil. Just look how peaceful that looks. Yeah, you try getting behind one of these when you're late for work. But that's where I grew up, home of the Pennsylvania Dutch, the Amish. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but if you have, if you've ever had a chance to go to an Amish farmhouse, one of the things you're going to notice about the horses there is that is that they all, they, 
they all have blinders on. They're all wearing blinders, partly as a fashion statement, sure, but mostly so that they can't see other options, so that they can't get distracted, right? Which makes sense for an Amish horse, because let's face it, if this is your source of transportation, you don't want to end up in a ditch because Cinnamon saw a gopher, right? So blinders on Amish horses, a great idea. Not such a great idea for technology decision makers, right? Technology decision makers, you want to be open to options. You want to be able to see other ways. You want to be able to see those yellow dots because the yellow dots is where the magic is. And again, you never know which dot is going to lead to the breakthrough. You never know. Um, January 10th, 1987. January 10th, 1987. It's a Saturday. It's a show day for my TV show, Almost Live. And we are pumped. We are pumped because we've gotten a genuine big name to be our guest on tonight's show. A genuine big name. Our guest on tonight's show is this guy. Johnny Depp. Okay, in fairness, he did not look like this then. Um, I don't, did any of you watching this, did, did, did any of you ever go through, like maybe in your teens, early 20s, ever go through that awkward stage? You know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, Johnny was going through his awkward stage too. I know. I mean, you, you, you guys, you, you men on this call, can you imagine having to go through your teens looking like that? Anyhow, Johnny, Johnny was shooting a TV show at the time uh, called 21 Jump Street. And they shot it in Vancouver, BC. And I was producing my show in Seattle. It's only a few hours apart. So I got a hold of Johnny on the show or, or on, on, on his set. I said, hey, you know, we'd love to have you as a guest. He said, great. I know the show. I watch your show. So, you know, so we picked a time. January 10th, 1987. That's the time. And again, we are just, we are so excited. We are so excited. Happy dance time. Happy dance time because Johnny's going to be our guest until about 11 o'clock in the morning. On the day of the show, I get a phone call. Uh, Bill, let's do it over here. It's, uh, listen, it's, it's Johnny Depp. By the way, this is what phones looked like back then. Remember that? How painful they were? It's Johnny Depp. Listen, um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to make it tonight. No, they scheduled reshoots for Jump Street, and I'm, I'm really sorry, but I, I, I can't get out of it. I've, I've got to cancel. You've been here, haven't you? You know this experience, don't you? This train wreck in your own world, right? Right? You know it. Where you've done, you've done, you've done everything right. You know, you think you have, and you have. You've done your due diligence. You've done the planning. You've dotted the I's. You've crossed the T's. You've done everything right. But then somehow there's that brick wall. The universe pulls the carpet out from under you, right? And you've had this experience, that train wreck. Well, that's what we were going through. And so now we're in a panic. You know, I, I call an emergency meeting, and we try and come up with a guest for tonight's show. It's got to be somebody local. So who are we going to get? Uh, how about one of them Seahawks? No, they're out of town this week. Oh, uh, what about that cute new anchor at Como TV? No, oh, she's in rehab. <sighs> she was. And on and on it goes. And it, it's starting to look hopeless, right? When all of a sudden, one of my writers, in fact, it was my, my, my lowest paid writer, pops his head up and says, uh, I, I might be able to do something with, um, <clears throat> with liquid nitrogen. Clearly, he did not understand the situation. I mean, we're looking for a guest to interview on the show, and he's babbling on about liquid nitrogen. By the way, this was my lowest paid writer. His name was Bill. Well, naturally, my first reaction to Bill's suggestion was, shut up, Bill, you're scaring us all. Okay, not my proudest moment, but why was that my first reaction? Because I was wearing blinders, wasn't I? We all were. And within our blinders, we were looking for a guest to interview. We couldn't see the different colored dots, right? But then fortunately, one of, my, one of my other staff members was able to lower his blinders for a little moment. He said, well, Bill, what are you talking about? And that's when Bill Nye started to paint a picture for us. He said, hey, hey, no, this could work, guys. I mean, liquid nitrogen is very cold. You take a marshmallow, toss in the liquid nitrogen. I take a pair of tongs, pull the marshmallow out, put it in my mouth, bite down, Smoke pours out of my nose and mouth. Oh, cool. And that night, this happened. 
And that's when this guy became this guy, who now hangs out with these guys. And on occasion, with this guy. Okay, so what happened there? What happened there? Well, why did that happen? It happened because Bill Nye was different than us. We were all writers and producers. Bill Nye was and is a science guy. He saw the world differently than we did. He was the yellow dot. And I almost missed it. We've got to be open to those yellow dots. Why did I almost miss it? Because I, because I dismissed Bill Nye, because he was my lowest paid writer. And why do we do that? You know, there are certain people that we just don't listen to because we think, well, the good ideas can't come from them, right? The lowest paid writer, the intern, the quiet person on the team. Have you found this to be true? That, you know, in meetings, it tends to be the loudest person who wins. Why is that? There is no correlation between volume and intelligence. So we miss the yellow dots when we don't listen to the quiet people also. I want to do one more survey for you. Um, let's see how, how you do with this one. Again, here it is. Here's the QR code. I want to find out. And by the way, these, this survey is completely anonymous. The question is, I proactively make sure that everyone on my team gets heard. And it's a scale from never, which is, you know, boo, hiss, to always, which is yay. So. Just where do you place yourself? And again, be honest, this is completely anonymous. Where do you place yourself on that scale of listening to, to people? Let's see where we have. Okay, we're seeing, okay, a 5.8. I don't know how many people have responded to this yet. The more that respond, okay, it's changing a little bit. But look at this. You, you folks are pretty good at this. You folks are pretty good. I don't always get, a lot of times it's under five for people. But this is great. This is really good news. Because you need to listen to everybody. Because again, you never know. You never know which dot is going to be the one that leads to the breakthrough. Right? That dot might be the quiet person. That dot might be the lowest paid writer. That dot might be the intern. That dot might be somebody from a completely different department who just happens to be there for some reason. And if we discount those, if we discount those differing viewpoints, we we could be missing out on the yellow dot that is that makes all the difference in the world, right? But it looks like you folks are doing well with this. Five point six. I see it keeps floating like between five five and five eight, which is which is pretty good. So we have to be open to those yellow dots because the yellow dots really really can make a great difference. I'll I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Um, this is a guy named Robert Palladino. Uh, Robert Palladino was a Trappist monk. He died a few years ago, and he taught college at, at a small liberal arts school just outside of Portland, Oregon. Uh, he taught a course on a subject that he was passionate about. He taught a course in calligraphy. Well, one of his students took that course. Actually, he was, wasn't even a student at the time. He had dropped out, but he was still auditing some courses. He, he took Robert Palladino's calligraphy course. Now, you may not have ever heard of Robert Palladino, but you may have heard of the student. His name was Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs had another interest. Steve Jobs dabbled in computers along with a friend of his named Steve Wozniak. And when they decided to build their own computer, Steve Jobs, thinking back to that yellow dot course that he took, the yellow dot of calligraphy said, hey, what if we build a computer that could do calligraphy? And that's what they did. And they invented the Macintosh which led to the creation of Apple computers with the, with the world's first $1 trillion company. More importantly, for us at least, most of us, it also led to the innovation, to the invention of this puppy, the iPhone, which let's face it, is our real significant other, isn't it? Come on. You and I both know that this thing, is, it's the last thing we talk to before we go to sleep. It's the first thing we talk to when we wake, we wake, up, when we wake up in the morning. And who would have thought, that this ubiquitous device that none of us can live without anymore owes its existence in part to a Trappist monk who taught calligraphy in Reed College just outside of Portland, Oregon. 
you never know which dot is going to lead to the breakthrough. Because think about it. Did calligraphy exist before Apple computers? Yeah. Did computers exist before Apple computer? Absolutely. So those two dots were already out there. Those two dots were already available, but nobody connected them until Steve Jobs did. Because let's face it, most of the computer people had not taken a calligraphy class. Therefore, that dot wasn't available to them. So we have to be open to collecting and then connecting those dots, including the yellow ones that nobody else would see. All the other computer people were busy collecting three quarter inch navy blue dots. And yeah, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak collected those also, but it was that yellow dot that made the difference. So how do you go about finding those dots? Let's say you're facing a challenge or you're seeing an opportunity. How do you train yourself to come up with those dots? Well, here's a technique I wanna use um, that I call the, the treasure map questions. The treasure map questions can help you unlock those innovative ideas, unlock those yellow dots. So let's talk about them. There are three of them. The treasure map questions. Next time you're facing a challenge, I want you to ask yourself these three questions in this order. First one, who else has solved a similar problem? And I don't mean who else in your world. I mean, who else outside of your world has solved a similar problem? You know, because chances are that wheel you're struggling with has already been invented someplace. It might not look the same because it might be a completely different industry, but start asking yourself, okay, who else has solved a similar problem. I don't have time to tell the story now, but there was a toothpaste manufacturer. And of course, toothpaste is all about making your teeth. They're whitest white. And they were trying to figure out, okay, what's, what, what kind of breakthrough can we use? You know who they talked to? Laundry detergent people. Because laundry detergent people also want to make whites whiter. So the toothpaste people looked outside, said, who else has solved this problem of making white things even whiter? Laundry detergent people. So think in your own world. Who else has solved a similar problem, a similar challenge to what you're facing right now? By the way, this works both in your professional and your personal life. Second question, of course, what did they do to solve it? And then the final question, the one that really unlocks everything, how can I apply their solution to my situation? Man, if you can just teach your brain to ask that question always, to kind of always have that question front burner, Another way of asking it really is just this. How can I apply this to my situation? If you can do that, man, there is no limit to the kind of innovations you can come up with. That's, that's when you become a game changer. Um, earlier, I told you all about, all about ketchup, right? I told you all about you know, ketchup and the upside down bottles and everything. Well, if you look at the bottle of ketchup, uh, I don't know if you can see it here, but it says Heinz. 57. Some of you may know that song, Heinz 57, 57 varieties. Some of you have heard that, right? Heinz 57. Do you know how that happened? In 1896, in 1896, Henry John Heinz, the founder of the company, H.J. Heinz, was riding the New York City elevated train. New York City used to have an L, kind of like Chicago does now. And he happened to glance down and he, and he saw in front of him a mom and pop shoe store, a sign that said 21 styles of shoes. Now, for most of us, we wouldn't even pay attention to that unless we were in the shoe business or maybe actively in the market for shoes. But for the rest of us, it would have gone way, we wouldn't have even noticed it, right? Yellow dot, but Heinz was open to the yellow dot. He looked at it and thought, that's kind of cool. How can I apply this to my situation? And so he went away and he came up with Heinz 57 varieties, which stood for the 57 varieties of food that Heinz actually made. Actually, at that time, Heinz made well over 60, but 57 was a more memorable number. So again, again, it's all about that. How can I apply this to my situation? You get yourself in the habit of asking those questions and there's, there's no stopping you. You know, ask yourself, what's the yellow dot here? For each of the education tracks at TM9 that you went through yesterday, for each of the conversations you're gonna have from now on, ask yourself, what's the yellow dot here? You know, maybe someday at the doctor's office, you're reading a magazine that you have no interest in, but it's the only thing there in the waiting room, right? Try this. Read an article that you have no interest in and ask yourself this question, though, as you're reading it. What's the yellow dot here? 
How can I apply this to my situation? I guarantee you, if you start asking yourself those questions, you'll find the answers. So I started off by telling you about, uh, about a plane ride. I want to end by telling you about another plane ride. Uh, I wasn't on this one, but my friend Jack was. Uh, Jack is very wealthy. He's semi-retired now, but he used to own a huge marketing firm. So he's made a lot of money. And on this particular day, uh, he was flying home from a business meeting in New York to his home. Jack lives in the Caribbean on the Turks and Caicos Islands. Now, if you think about the Turks and Caicos Islands, you probably think of it as a playground for the rich and famous, which it is. But, you know, people live there, too. And that's where Jack lives. So on this day, he was flying home from New York to the Caribbean, to Turks and Caicos. Like me, Jack had an aisle seat. Unlike me, Jack's aisle seat was in first class. But like me, the seat next to Jack was empty. Until just before the doors close, one last passenger gets on the plane. And she sits right next to Jack. Now, unlike me, Jack is a natural connector, which is one of the reasons why he was so successful in business. So Jack strikes up a conversation with his seatmate, whose name is Patty. And eventually Patty asks Jack what he does for a living. And Jack said, well, I'm actually semi-retired now, but I used to be in marketing. But right now, because I am mostly retired, I, I get to indulge my passion, which is music. I'm a, I'm a drummer and a blues singer. Patty took one look at Jack in his tailor-made, custom-made three-piece suit and said, well, you don't, you don't look much like a musician. Ah, that's because I just got out of a business meeting, didn't I? But if you were to see me eight hours from now, I'd look completely different because you see, it's Wednesday. And every Wednesday night, my local neighborhood pub has an open jam session. So eight hours from now, that's where I'll be, playing drums and singing the blues. It's my favorite thing to do in the world. Yeah, oh, I, I know exactly what you mean. My, my husband's a musician and he feels the exact same way. Right, right, so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's a great hobby, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I mean, my husband's a professional, but, you know, but yeah, it is. Oh, is he? Oh, well, good for him. Good for him. That's not easy to do, is it? It's not easy to make a living as a musician. Is he, is he a solo performer? Is he in a band? Oh, no, 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 he's in a band. Well, good for him. Is it anybody I might have ever heard of? Um, maybe um, the Rolling Stones. Eight hours later, Jack's in his local pub behind the drums. He's playing the blues. They had just started their second set when the door opens and in walks Patty with her husband. And that's the day that my friend Jack spent an hour jamming with Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. You never know which dot is going to be the one that leads to the breakthrough. You never know which, which connection is going to lead to the opportunity of a lifetime. I missed out on my connection. I missed out because I didn't connect a dot that was sitting right next to me for five hours. The, the yellow dots, they're, they're all around you. They're all around you. They're in the meetings you've had at TM9. They're on the plane. They're in the grocery store. And they're just waiting for you to connect them. That's how you innovate. That's how you create the breakthroughs. That's how you become a game changer. I'm Bill Staten. It's been an absolute honor being with all of you today. And now back to the host with the most, Mr. Ryan Graven. Ryan, are you there? Ryan, you are there. My friend, you crushed it.